Welcome to Strip Cover Lit, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Ford, and we are here for another poetry discussion, which will appear in two separate playlists here on the channel. Number one, obviously, the Poetry Discussions playlist, now over 200 videos strong, but also the Emily Dickinson playlist, now over 50 videos strong. And the poem that we have in question today is one that I think brings some mystery about the very subject matter of the poem, uh, the first about. What's the poem about? Well, X, Y, and Z. But what's the poem about? Something different. Uh, the something different, the second about, I think is fairly clear with this poem. The poem in question is called, I Like to See It Lap the Miles. A bit of a provocative first line, but I like to see it lap the miles and lick the valleys up and stop to feed itself at tanks and then prodigious step around a pile of mountains and supercilious pier in shanties by the sides of roads and down and then a quarry pair, to fit its sides and crawl between, complaining all the while, in horrid hooting stanza, then chase itself down hill, and neigh like Boanerges, Boanerges, then prompter than a star, stop, docile and omnipotent, at its own stable door. Now, I had trouble figuring out if I thought this poem was about the river or a train. We have a little hints at each, but we also have this idea of uh, horses at the end. But then I got to thinking about it. Is this about a train or is this about a river? Does it matter? The subject of this poem may be superfluous because the actual theme of the poem could be the same either way. The subject of this poem being either a, well, we'll, we'll throw the horse in too, either a river or a train or a horse. These are all forms of transportation. It just depends on how far back you want to go. Being as they are, all forms of transportation, the first thing you always want to think of with a river, symbolically, what is a river? Rivers oftentimes are used to symbolize the passage of time. Couldn't trains be used in much the same fashion? And while we're at it, traveling on horseback could be seen much the same as well. But why are these things seen as symbolic for the passage of time. Well, if you or I started off on foot to go from where we are to 400 miles away, wherever that might be, if we did that on foot, it would take us a very long time. Jumping forward to the train, which is to us several forms of transportation back, but to Emily Dickinson would have been the, the new game in town. Going to, so for me, I'll just say Oklahoma, Kansas City, Missouri to Oklahoma. Are there cities in Oklahoma? I don't know. I think it's just a, a one city state, Oklahoma. Um, which is the same thing that people in Oklahoma say about Missouri and people on either coast say about both of us. So don't get too mad at me if you're watching this from Oklahoma. But if I were to travel from here to Oklahoma on foot, take a very long time. But if I go on a train, it saves me weeks 
of travel. So if there's something I have to do in Oklahoma, traveling there on train saves me weeks. Those weeks of my life are then a thing that I owe to that train. So no, I don't think that it matters what we're actually talking about when we're talking about the the time saved here. I think we're talking about time and time saved. I think we're talking about the only resource that any of us have, which is irreplaceable. Someone comes up to you on the street and demands your wallet. You give it to them. You can earn that money back. Someone steals your car. You can buy another car. But those weeks spent walking to Oklahoma would be gone. And strangely enough, Emily Dickinson does have another poem about the passage of time in this fashion. I had not realized I was going to talk about this. Give me one second to pull it up. It is called If You Were Coming in the Fall. And it reads as such. I'm sorry that I don't have it visually represented on screen, but I think that it uh, it's going to do it is going to serve this conversation well. If you were coming in the fall, I'd brush the summer by with half a smile and half a spurn, as housewives do a fly. If you were coming in a year, I'd wind the months in balls and put them each in separate drawers for fear the numbers fuse. If only centuries delayed, I'd count them on my hand, subtracting till my fingers dropped into Van Diemen's land. In s- if certain when this life was out, that yours and mine should be, I'd toss it yonder like a rhyme and take eternity. But now, uncertain of the length of this that is between, it goads me like the goblin bee that will not state its sting. We have in Emily Dickinson this strange ability to warp Time. We have this ability to take time and make it as um, a small moment big. I heard a fly buzz when I died. When I died is a very small moment. It is an instant, in fact. If you were coming in the fall, I'd brush the summer by. That is an entire season. If certain when this life was out that yours and mine should be, I'd toss it yonder like a rind. That is an entire lifetime that Emily Dickinson is able to just cast aside. And here, in this poem, this poem is not either of those sentiments. This poem is just the observation of the thing itself. I like to see it lap the miles and lick the valleys up and stop to feed itself at tanks and then prodigious step around a pile of mountains and supercilious peer in shanties by the sides of roads and then a quarry pair to fit its sides and crawl between, complaining all the while. This is just an observation of the thing, which there are, so Emily Dickinson has 1,775 poems. And when you start reading them, you start to notice that there are things which the artist will comment on and comment on in a different way and comment on in a little bit different way. Uh, The one that gets me as publication is the auction of the mind of man, or I think that's how it goes. Um, You can see, not in real time, but in real literary time, you can see the artist changing her mind. The speaker changing their mind, I guess I should say. But you can see these differences, these variances 
in ways that we don't get very often from writers, that we don't get very often from anyone, to be quite frank. How often does someone tell us they've changed their mind on something? And here's, you know, Emily Dickinson didn't have Microsoft Word. Emily Dickinson, um, there's a book behind me, was gifted to me by my friend Jen, wrote all of her poems, kind of like if you've ever seen 8 Mile, the way that Eminem would scratch down rhymes on random sheets of paper. That's what Emily Dickinson did. So this poem here is in the 300s, the late 300s. I can't remember the exact number. Late 300s, we'll say 375. There were 374 poems before this. There were 1,400 poems after this. This was a living, breathing human being who did this very thing, observed and commented 1,775 times, observed and commented. Not all of them are as naked as this. Not all of them are as simply, here's a thing and let me tell you how I see it. Many of them, most of them, go into some type of nearly dire philosophy. I died for beauty, but was scarce adjusted in the tomb when one who died for truth was laying in an adjoining room. Truth versus beauty. How are they the same? How are they different? What is going on there? How might they get along? It is incredible to have these little nuggets of Emily Dickinson's imagination and to have so many different sides of one subject like the passage of time. It's very important, the passage of time. No. Um, commented on by, by one writer. That is all I have for this poetry discussion. If you enjoy what I do here, hitting the like button really does me a lot of good on this channel. It tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers. And if you find yourself here by chance but not design, I talk poetry every Monday. Every Monday. Every Monday. But I also do short stories. I also do novel relongs, things like that. So uh, if you hit the subscribe button, maybe you could come back for the next one. I hope to see you for the next one.